Good afternoon, everyone, and good afternoon, Kaylin, and thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Camille Hoisington, and I'm Director of Strategic Projects at Travis Connect, and it's my pleasure to take off today's webinar, Focal, Filler, and Flare, Change Career or Start a Business Without Fear or Hesitation. Just so you all know, today's webinar is being recorded and it will be posted to the Travis Connect YouTube page within 24 hours, so you can watch it again or you can share it with your network. Our speaker will present for the first 45 minutes or so, and then there'll be time at the end for Q&A. So to submit a question, please use the Q&A button, which you'll find located at the bottom of your screen, and your questions will be addressed at the end of the webinar. With that, I'd like to briefly introduce our guest speaker today. Kaylin Sheik is a creative entrepreneur, a TED speaker, an award-winning floral designer, and the owner of Sweetwater Floral. From her flower studio on a tiny farm in Petoskey, she flowers for events, teaches sold out workshops in the country and helps people design a life that they love. Her workshops and retreats aim to help people find that what, that what makes them unique. A former television presenter, Kaylin documents the life of a small business owner on social media daily. When she's not flowering or speaking, she's in the kitchen making soup and spending time with her growing family. Kaylin, thank you again so much. It's a pleasure to have you here today and over to you. Thanks, Camille. This is exciting. Hi, everybody. I am um, super stoked to be here. I'm Kaylin. Uh, I know a, a bunch of you, I feel like, but maybe I don't. So if you've never met me, I am going to do a little bit of a brief intro. And then I'm also feeling very legit because I've never used Zoom in such a professional way as Camille knows. So you can dump everything you want to know in the Q&A. She has like some sweet settings going. So without further ado, let's get to it. Hope everyone's having a good day. It's like sunny here, which is very rare at this time of year. So I'm feeling I'm feeling good, like I should. Okay. Okay, so you should be able to see my screen. We are going to talk about focal filler and flare today. Um, making career transitions without fear or hesitation. Uh, I should, I guess there's an added note. It should be without fear paralyzing you because I think a little healthy dose of fear is good for us. Um, but I also feel like uh, we can do you know, sort of whatever it is that we want to do. I don't think we should design lives that corner us in, which we're going to talk about. A little intro. This is me in the summer when my roots aren't seven inches long. Uh, my, like Camille said, I'm Kaylin Sheik. I'm a creative entrepreneur. I'm a florist. And I used to be a television reporter. And we're going to talk a lot about that. Um, what Sweetwater is, that's our company, is it is an all-encompassing brand with one goal, and that goal is to bring more joy to people's lives, mainly through flowers. And so sometimes we host virtual workshops, in-person workshops. Um, I teach online a lot. Some of you in here today, I believe, are my online students, so thanks for showing up, you guys. Um, I document everything on social media very painstakingly because I love showing a glimpse into our, our story and the brand that we're building. We, my husband and I, we own a very small, very small little farm in Petoskey, Michigan. Um, and when we bought it, it was like sort of a rundown piece of crap. And it's still sort of a rundown piece of crap, but city people love chippy old stuff is my favorite line. So it's attracted people from around the country to come and visit and flower with us. And we have a tiny house here they can stay in. But really our goal is that Sweetwater, which is also the name of our farm, is a place where people forget about the rat race. Because when I left behind the rat race, my entire life changed. And we're gonna talk about that. Also, I'm so out of breath. I apologize, I'm like literally so winded. So my current condition is just a lot of water breaks. Okay. A brief history into uh, my story. So my entire life, people told me I would be a great television reporter. And so I literally went and became a great television reporter. It was like very much how so many millennials, especially um, find their chosen career path, which is you go do what people told you you were good at your whole life. Um, and it's pretty crazy that we make these decisions at 18 years old, 19 years old. So you were always a good athlete and smart. So you go become a physical therapist. 
Um, you always have the heart of a teacher. So you become a classroom teacher. You, uh, you would be such a, you're so compassionate. You would be a great nurse. So you go become a nurse. And I think that um, that puts a lot of pressure on us, especially women, which I'm broadcasting this for all identities. But I feel like if you identify as a woman, um, this is a, just a lot of pressure already on top of a lot of pressure at a really vulnerable age. So at 18 years old, I had to sign up for a college major. I had been a terrible student in high school, horrendous. Um, graduated high school with a 2.3 or a 2.4 GPA. I mean, it was bad, really bad um, because I hated school, it wasn't for me, but I was a really good public speaker. I had really great people skills. And that was like, people were just like, you'd be a great, you'd be a great television personality. And I was a news hound. I was like really a news junkie. So I signed up to be a journalism major with a minor in television. And I went and studied for four years and became a TV reporter. What it does to us, I believe, is that it sort of sets your life path for you. And then we don't wanna rock the boat too intensely. Although we are a loud generation of activists and we are changing the world. I'm talking about millennials more so than any other generation known to man. We still don't like to piss people off. We still don't want especially um, parental figures. If you grew up in a household where your parents, a parent, an adult, a grandparent supported you and believed in you, the last thing you want to do is say to them, I think I'm going to do something different. So that's a little bit of my history personally. So I um, had the incredible opportunity to be a TED speaker. Um, and I, my the talk, title of my TED talk is Focal Filler and Flare. And this is the topic that I speak on the most often, which is I realized through flowers that the basic elements of floral design are also how we can change careers without fear or hesitation. So we're gonna go over focal filler and flare, how it relates to my story. And then I really want you to reflect and think about how it relates to your story as well. And um, I hope you take something away from it. Quick aside, these are all dahlias on the background that I grew. I'm like really proud of myself, it's crazy. I knew nothing, I knew nothing about growing flowers. Okay, so focal. In floral design, and I know there are some florists in here today, focal blooms are our biggest ones. They are, they sort of set the shape. If you're an artist, they are the things that create the most weight in an arrangement or the scale. So focal blooms that you may know of, dahlias, which are the background of our image we see here, sunflowers, roses, hydrangea is a really popular one. Um, anything that's big and weighty and really helps set the scene, like water break. But while I'm sipping this water, think about what your focal attributes are. And I always say your focal stuff is what you were born inherently just naturally good at. So for me, my focal blooms that I was born with, people skills, um, public speaking. I like to think I'm, I make people feel pretty comfortable. I'm um, able to walk into a room and work a room. Um, a lot of soft skills. These are my focal blooms. Your focals may be, you've always been just, it's easy without question, no little to no effort required at math or science. Um, you may think that taking care of people came really easy to you. Um, if you're a parent, you may be like, you know what, I think one of my focal blooms is that I was like really born to be a parent. There are so many different focal blooms. And I hope if you're taking notes, you scribble yours down right now because we're going to come back to them. Focal blooms never leave us. Never. You are not leaving behind any of your focal filler or flare when you change careers. And in my own story, I was so hesitant to go try something new because I thought, well, florists, I like flowers and I love designing them, but florists don't really need like all my amazing skills. And so I was sort of, it probably, you know, added another year or two before my entrepreneurial journey really took off because I was convinced that 
I couldn't use my people skills to leverage in my business. So whatever your focal skills are, look at them on your list. You can leverage those into your career transition. Next, filler. I think filler gets a bad rap. If you've ever seen me talk, I don't think I give it enough credit. Okay, so filler, what is our filler blooms? In floral design, it is our medium to small blooms that fill in space, very simple. But in our lives, I like to say that your filler blooms are life experiences that helped shape you. So these would be things like becoming a parent, meeting your partner, winning a state championship in high school, winning some type of award at your current position, um, being recognized for something. Filler blooms can also be life experiences that weren't so fun. Um, grief, trauma, really horrendous things if you're a cancer survivor, if you've lost somebody you love very suddenly. Those are things that are marked on us that we don't ever forget or leave behind. So we have our focal, which is our big, bright, incredible things we were born with. Our filler, which is our life experiences that help shape us. Okay, another really good example of filler is where you went to school. If you went to college, chances are your four years in school are one of your fillers. They, you meet people that change your life. You really come into your own if you were lucky enough to go study somewhere. Um, if you were lucky enough to study abroad, that's always a filler, I say, for people. So look at your list. I always recommend putting five to six down if you can. But what your filler are, are not going anywhere. It's not being left behind again. I was so paralyzed and frozen that if I left TV, that was my entire identity. Um, and a lot of my filler is experiences I had on television and people I met through working in television. So whatever your fillers are, honor and respect them. Fillers are sweet. Lastly, my personal favorite. Layer, zing, look at that summerscape. Doesn't that look so nice right now? It's like day one of winter and I'm like, ugh. Okay, so flare. In floral design and looking at this arrangement, flare is the stuff that is above our arrangement that makes it a little weird and a little different or below. So here I would say, if you can see my mouse, this like branch I cut from the graph, from the yard with all the cool colors. And then you'll see I have apples down here like on a dying branch. I love this arrangement. Those are flare. Flare are the things in our creative work that are a little bit out there, a little bit different, but it puts our own personal style on things. That's what flare is in you. What is your flare? Flair is what makes you uniquely you when you are not in the room. What are people talking about with you? Are they saying, oh my gosh, Camille always has the greatest, most like trendy outfit on? That would be Camille's flair. Are they saying, oh my gosh, do you know that anytime Tom is with us, he can play a new song on the guitar? Flair is your weird, but, but fun and loved hobby or talent that you've woven into who you are. Your flair can just be that you have a lot of flair, that you're a little out there. I love weird people and weird things. Um, your flair can be that anytime somebody sees you, you're working on a new creative project. Your flair can be that you may, you know, punch a clock for 40 hours a week working somewhere at a very corporate accounting job, but you build the most incredible birdhouses and you sell them on Etsy. Like, your flair is this unique thing that many people don't know about you, but those who do are like, oh yeah, that's just what makes them them. So I'd be curious what some of your flair is that you're listing. And also feel free, I'm not, I can't see the chat, but feel free to like be in the chat and dumping what your flair is, what your focal is, what your filler is, if you want to, because it really helps other people get inspired as well. Okay, so we have our focal, filler, and flair. Now that you've identified all three, this is where fear comes in because you came to this webinar for a reason. I don't know what it is. Maybe you are really considering a 
career change. Maybe you are considering uprooting your life and, and building a completely new version of your life, ideally in Michigan's creative coast. That's where we live up here. But whatever drew you here, I like to think that there's a decision you're weighing and that there's some fear with it. Um, like we talked about in the beginning, if you're a millennial, you went to school, you checked all the boxes, you found a partner, you Instagram your brunch, when we can go brunch. Do you guys remember brunch? What a concept. Um, you, you do all the things, you're fitting into this neat little box that people built for you and you're happy, but are you fulfilled? I think they're so different. I think you can be happy and still sort of think that whatever you're doing for a living sucks. Um, because I genuinely, I do not blow smoke up people's rear ends. I wake up every single day excited to do my work. Even the stuff I hate, which is, there's a lot of things about my job that I don't like. And the fear between me leaving TV and going out to be a creative entrepreneur was that, well, if I leave this neat box that I'm in, where I have a successful job with benefits, um, I'm on a trajectory upward, the sky is really the limit. What makes me so great at being on television will be left behind. And that just simply is not true because what makes you so great is on the list in front of you. You wrote down all your focal, your filler and your flare. And we don't leave our focal filler and flare in boxes in our cubicles. We don't say, all right, guys, this was so great. Thank you for having me. I loved being on staff for six years. I'm leaving and I will never again be funny or talented or good at accounting or a great teacher. I think your focal, your filler, your flair are what can make you build a new career into a life that you designed that is so fulfilling. So when I started Sweetwater, it, was, it had a different name and it sucked. It was horrible. We still did weddings. They were good. Our clients were happy, paid my bills. Um, but everything felt like I was walking through sand. Like, why is this so hard? Why is starting a business and creating a brand so painstakingly hard? And it wasn't hard like this is hard work. It was hard like this is like taking a toll on me. Like it didn't feel like there was any staying power. And I feel like if you're into creating your own small business, your own creative business, leaving behind a career, and it feels like it has no staying power, I would argue to say that it's because you're not building something that's uniquely you. I would argue to say that you're building something that you think is what you should build. build. So I want you to really look at your list, your focal, your filler, your flare. That's your secret sauce, to use a term that's a little overused right now, but it is. That's what makes you you. No one else on the planet, this is like really woo and out there, but no one else on the planet would write down exactly the focal filler and flare that you have written down. Think about that. So why are you trying to have a career or have a life like somebody else dreamt up for you or that looks like something you should have? Why are you trying to build a business, create a brand, become an entrepreneur, and you're following what boxes you think you should check instead of saying, oh, there's an easier way to do this. I'll just build it so it feels like me. Water break. This is also the time during my presentations that I'm like, okay, everyone relax. You know, if you've been with me before, relax your jaw. We're holding a lot of tension in our shoulders. I like to think that it's an empowering talk. It's not like a downer. Because the fear should be a healthy amount. It's really scary. I mean, the day I left the television station, I drove home and I got home and um, my now husband, Matt, he was at work. It was just my boyfriend at the time. No, he was my husband then. Oh my gosh, the years fly. And I just sort of like looked around our house and I was like, now what do I do? Oh my gosh, I left behind a steady paycheck and, and I had the business and the business was going, I could have worked on it, but I was just paralyzed 
waiting for this other shoe to drop that I was going to be terrible. That it was all going to blow up in my face. And it had a pretty high chance of blowing up in my face because the brand that I had built at that point really was not a direct reflection of me. It was a direct reflection of what I thought florists in this area should be doing. And if you're going against, if you're, if you're fighting the wind and building your brand, it will never feel fulfilling. So build a brand that feels like you. Healthy dose of fear, healthy dose of fear. And I always say this, if it blows up in your face, which it might, go back and do what you were doing. I help women all year figure out businesses that are gonna work for them. And a lot of times what they figure out is that they don't wanna be in business for themselves. They really just needed a change of schedule at their old job, change of leadership, change of a workplace. Um, so a little bit of fear is good. It'll, you know, sort of light a fire under you. Oh my God, is that my last slide? It's only 25 minutes. That's okay. I hope you guys have tons of questions. Okay, here's me. Yay, stay in touch. You can follow me on Instagram, Sweetwater Floral. You can read all about us at sweetwaternorth.com. But I think all of you know that because I think a lot of you are already familiar with the story. I'm going to bop out of this screen share and we can do like 20 minutes of questions. Nothing is off limits. I'm hoping my camera doesn't freeze too bad when I do this. Stand by. Okay. Um, the first question, this is a really good one. How did family and friends react to making a career change? Uh, did they try and talk me out of it? I really felt like no one got it. And if you are in this process where you feel like it, it's one of the hardest seasons because everyone just thought it was like a cute little flower hobby. So they'd be like, oh, Kaylin, that's so, that's so great that you're making those flower arrangements for people. And I would be like, no, people are paying me like to do their wedding flowers. Like, this is really exciting. And I feel like I'm really lucky to have an incredibly supportive family, incredibly supportive. But I feel like it, it, you gotta meet people where they are in what really shows them um, some serious gumption. So like my mom, she, no one ever tried to say, I don't really think you should do that as much as they were like, really, you're going to leave TV, but you're so good at it. Oh my gosh, but honey, you're so good at it. So that's like my mom. And I would say to her, I know I'm good at it, but there are other things I can be good at. I can be really great at it. And then I would say to my mom, if I, if it blows up in my face, I'll go back and get a TV job. It's like very cut and dry. My dad, on the other hand, I'm super close to my parents. My dad is like a numbers guy. So for me to be like, I'm really onto something here. He was like, okay. But then when I was like, I did X amount of dollars in sales last year. He was like, wow. Okay. Whoa. Like you could really make a, a stab at this. So I think knowing who needs what really helps in being able to share with people what your plan is. Um, and then there's Matt, my husband. And he was the one who was like, I believe in you, we can do this, but we need to make a plan. So I wanna be really clear that I did not just walk out of TV and not have anything lined up with the brand. The brand, Sweetwater, had met my television income in earning potential so I knew that I wasn't just starting from zero. I really do not believe in starting from zero um, when you leave behind your steady paycheck. I really believe in, in walking this line with both for a long time until you can successfully leap over to one. No one ever tried to talk me out of it, but yeah, they don't get it. This is Becca's question. They're not gonna get it. And um you really leaving behind the rat race, which is essentially what I did. You really need to almost put blinders on and be like, I'll just prove everybody wrong. Like, um, 
I will decide that this is, and I also like have this in me where I love proving people wrong. Like I love being doubted. I think a lot of business owners have this. I love when people are like, there's no way. I'm like, well, let's watch this happen. So I think just knowing that not everyone's going to get it right away, but the people who love you will come on board eventually. And then if they roll out, which a lot of people from my television time did, a lot of my friends from TV um, didn't talk to me for a few years. That's their own thing. That's their own insecurities. That's their own, I'm really uncomfortable. This makes me really uncomfortable because I can't believe she did it. That's not on you. <sighs> Goodbye. Hope that answers your question. Whoa, there's tons of questions. I feel cool. Okay. How did I land on floral design? Great question. Were there any other areas? So I always say that if it wasn't floral design, it would be something else. Entrepreneurs are meant to be entrepreneurs. Um, and if you've been with me for a while, a lot of you have been following for a really long time. Um, you know that it's just grown and grown and grown from we used to just do weddings to now there's so much more to the brand. How did it become flowers was flowers were my escape from the really, really hard parts of my job. So I just saw that there was, all the boxes were checked. Like I loved doing it. It was really, really fun for me. That's easy. Number two, I knew that it could be profitable. So I wasn't like, you know what? I'm going to leave behind um, my television career to sell, you know, tissue box, knitted crocheted things. And that's it. Because I could not replace my income with one tiny product. So I knew that I needed to have something that was higher budget. I needed to look at the market I was in. Um, you really need to think about who, do you have people you can sell to? Do you have connections already? Do you already have that network? So I already had a bunch of friends in the wedding industry up here. I sort of had a pulse on it. I had just gotten married myself. And so knowing that, okay, we know some people, like we really could sort of hop in here with two feet is really important. Um, and then flowers were really, you got to look at global trends on the up and up. Oh my God, my tree looks so cute. Um, I'm really grateful that I got into flowers when I did because now they're trendy as hell. It's so trendy. We're going to have a show on Magnolia. Not me. I wish. Um, HGTV is giving more time to flowers. You see spreads in magazines. Like it's sort of where the food industry was 25 years ago. Like there's just now flower celebrities. So you got to look at the national market for what you, what it is you want to do. Those are my tips for how did I pick floral design? It was sort of my creative outlet at the time. And then I really took it and ran with it. Oh my gosh, a stay-at-home mom for nine years. Way to be. And I'm, okay, so this question says, I've been a stay-at-home mom for nine years and I'm a little scared at the next step. What tips do you have? Number one, you've done the work. You've done stay-at-home mom as one myself who also works while I'm here. It's not easy. Um, my tips would be know that if you're at the point where you feel like you have the time to do it, you are going to be so productive with your time. You're going to be so productive with your time. Um, because if you're at this point where you're like, okay, I think I can take a stab at it. There's something I would venture to guess in your life where you're like, okay, there's a little more time available. Maybe all the kids are in school full time, something like that. My other tips would be just what I was just saying, know your market. These are like my top tips, know your market. Who are you going to sell to? Who's gonna buy your thing, hire you for your service? And number two, start first on a brand. What do I mean start first on a brand? You can't just sell to people who you sort of know around town. And then meanwhile, you're like working on a website. I always say like, do a little bit of legwork before going live. So build a website. Anyone in here can build a website. There are 38 of us in here. Every single person is talented enough to build a website on Squarespace. It does not have to be perfect, but I would say build a website, have a logo designed, have a name, just little tiny things so that as more and more people hear about you, we give people as consumers one shot. I am ruthless. 
I am ruthless. I give people one shot. If someone says to me, oh, we own a dog groomer. You should check us out. Here's the name of my dog grooming place. I say, sweet. If I go to look you up and I can't find anything, if I call a number and the number's not real, if I go look you up on Instagram and you don't exist, if I go look you up on Facebook and you don't exist, I'm done. I'm not, I don't want to hunt down people to give my money to. So my number one tip is for if you're making this big jump, do a little bit of brand work first. Mandy asks, when did I come to the decision to add employees and build a team? How long did I run things solo? Woof, so important, Mandy. Um, I ran things solo for two and a half years. The first person I ever had come on to help me was an unpaid intern, which was really amazing because she was getting college credit for it. And through her program, she had to have like a couple hours a week at this internship. And it was sort of like a match made in heaven. From there, so that was year three, I brought people on in all different capacities. Um, but the first person I ever had on was just an extra set of hands, really. Taylor was learning so much with me. Um, we're still great friends. And I sort of said to her, look, I can't pay you. This will be an unpaid internship. But if you bust your ass for me all summer, I will find you your dream job. Like I know enough people. So really getting creative with who you bring on and how you bring them on. Are there students? Students are so helpful. Um, we have so many high school students who have come and helped us and we pay a very fair, amazing wage, I like to think. But knowing that, I wish more than anything, I could hire people who are my age and want careers and want full-time you know, jobs with benefits. We just aren't in that position. So I hire mostly subcontractors and then I have a couple people who are with me year round, they're my end all be all. I always said the decision to bring on more people is always when you could make more money if you had more hands. But for those first few years, it was just me, Matt, unpaid, my sister, unpaid, but I would buy her a lot of food. Now she's paid because she works with us so regularly. Um, but the first few years are a, a slog. I warn everybody, the first few years are a slog. Going, as you're going through a big life change, what tools do I use? What tools do you use to remind yourself of my own unique focal filler and flare? This is a great question. Um, I sometimes, you guys, a lot of you know me, sometimes I get so down in the dumps about it. I have little black cloud sort of like creeps in and I'll just be like, what is the point of all this hard ass work? Like, where's the business going? It's, you know, we're not doing anything. It's hard. I always reflect back to my focal filler and flare because I always think what gets me unstuck is my focal filler and flare. Because I'll look at what's happening, you know, out in the industry and flowers and I'll watch and I will say, okay, we need to make a change. What do I bring to the table that I can do this differently and better? It's not like I'm the only person in America who does wedding flowers or who sells wreath kits, but I'm the only person in America who does it this way. And that's what I tell people all the time. So when you're going through these major life changes, you are starting a business, you're having kids, you're getting married, you're moving locations, you're leaving behind an old career, always falling back on what you wrote down today. Always reminding yourself, I have a note in my phone with all mine typed out. And whenever I'm like, what should we do? What should we offer next? I go in there and I'm like, okay, what do I have that is, that is different than anybody else? I think it's so important. How do I get motivated to do the admin things that are part of building a business that I'm not excited about? Woof! It's so hard. It's so hard. I hire people to hold me accountable. So it's like we have a bookkeeper. And so I have to, I have to email her back. I have to answer her questions. Um, we have an accountant for the business. And, you know, a couple times a year, quarterly, Dan is banging on the door, not literally, but asking me for stuff. 
Um, and then I just realized that some of it's the cost of doing business and it sucks bad. There's this really common disbelief in entrepreneurship, especially flowers, that I just like play with flowers all day. Like, it's just, oh my gosh, how amazing your studio, your farm, oh my gosh. And I'm like, now that I, we've got to the level of success that we have, which we're still growing, I spend 90% of my time chained to a computer, just answering emails. And it is not my favorite thing. I did not start my own business to email back clients or build contracts and proposals, but just knowing that I need to find the motivation to do it because it's part of my job. This is also one of my firm beliefs on social media. Like I post regularly and show up every day because that's part of my job. And I don't really stand for the excuse of people saying, well, I don't have time. I just don't have time for the social media thing. And I'm like, okay, do you ever say at the end of the year, I don't have time to do my taxes. I just don't have time. I wish I could say that to the IRS, but come on now. There are things we're going to have to do for our businesses similar to there are things that we had to do in our old careers. There were day things every single day I had to do a live head at 4.45 in the morning. And I'd be like, what? Who is watching at 4.45? But there I was with a microphone. I wasn't like, I don't really have the time. It doesn't really fly for me. Nope. The admin things that are a pain. I just, I try and batch my work. So a lot of times I'll be like, okay, Wednesday this week, I'm going to take care of all this admin stuff, pay bills, um, email clients back, have my calls. So batching work, but just also understanding that it's just part of doing business. Oh my gosh, a stay at home dad. Yes. Hell yeah to the dads. I loved the last question, feeling the same anxiety. Way to go. It's, um, Parenting will teach you so much about time management that I, I argue to say that, you know, one of my mentors told me very, very early on, she's like, I love hiring moms. She's like, I love hiring moms. She was a floral designer. She's like, because moms get done. They just do. She's like, they never get flustered at weddings. They're never they're like melting down. What are we going to do? They're just like, okay, what needs to happen? So I always say, anyone who's been a stay-at-home parent, you're like, you're already a little bit ahead of the pack. Do I have any tips on building a brand when the nuts and bolts of the business are still in development? This is a really, really great question. Um, Isabella, hi. Fun fact, Isabella is a former Sweetwater bride. I'm so glad you're here. Um, okay, so... Building your brand when the nuts and bolts of the business are still in development. You already know what your vibe is going to be, right? You already know things about your brand, regardless of your services or exactly what you offer. You may already know what it's going to look and feel like. So I would say do as much as you can right now. Can you get a logo drawn up? You know about what, I know you know what industry you're going into. Can you get a color scheme set? Can, do you have a name? Can you get a website going? Can you fill in the stuff on the website that isn't gonna change? Like your about me section or your why we chose this. Obviously our products, our services, our offerings are always gonna be in flux. They're always gonna be changing. And you might, Isabella say six months from now, oh my gosh, I thought we were gonna offer this and now we're not, you can just scrap it. But the brand, building a brand is like building a muscle. Um, the more you work at it and the more you use it, it's so much easier. It's like, I look at myself from six years ago, deciding on things. And now someone can pitch me, what products are we going to sell in the swag shop? And I can rattle them. I can decide in three seconds because I know our brand so well. And I know who our consumer is so well. So I think um, developing the brand as best you can for the surface things. And also populating a social media account with still relative information. So even though you may not know your exact product services or offerings, knowing that your Instagram account, if someone stumbles upon it, has been having things added to it regularly that are on topic for your brand. Okay, I need some water. I'm so out of breath.
How did it feel to build a brand while working a full-time job? Incredibly hard. Um, okay, this person says, some days I'm so excited about my business idea that I'm tempted to drop the salaried position. But my small business is not meeting my income needs at this point. Great question. I would not, not drop it, even though it's so tempting. It's so tempting. Because what happens if you drop it? And then you resent your business brand that you were developing that you once loved so much. You know what I'm saying? Um, what I did was I just did it in the fringe hours. I was a crazy person, but I would do it super, super early in the morning when I came home from work before I went to bed. On weekends, um, just finding that fringe time to build the brand and then I also took a lot of my vacation time from TV to do things that would allow us to expand our small business. So for me, that was my vacation days where I, I was flowering. We were traveling for weddings. We were doing all these sorts of things. Um, but I would not, I know how tempting it is. I know how tempting it is. But I would not leap from one to the next until you have the income potential. And the income potential is not just I'm really confident I could do this. Income potential is like, okay, you know what? We did 20 weddings. I'm using weddings as an example. We can use pop-up shops. I did 10 markets last year and they went really, really well. And I made this much money. And if I can book 13 markets for next year, I should be able to do it. Income potential is knowing your numbers and knowing where you need to be. When they line up, the jump is so much less risky less stressful on your family. And um, I think it feels a lot more fulfilling. How long after the launch of my first brand did I decide it did not feel right? This is a very great question from Blake. I was in it about two, three years. Um, and I realized probably two years, 18 months to two years. Like, what the hell am I doing? I'm trying to be somebody I'm not. I'm trying to impress. Here's another thing I did so much. Oh my gosh. I thought way too much about other people who did what I did. So I would think, what are other florists going to think about this? What are other floral designers going to think about this? What is, um, what are other wedding industry professionals going to think about this? Who cares? Who cares? Are you selling flowers to other florists? Are you selling wine you make to other vineyards? So they can, like, what? Are you selling your art to other artists? Are you, are you in direct, the people you are in direct competition, which I hate that word, people who, who do exactly what you do are not the ones you're building your brand for. And I feel like so often we um, build brands and businesses that feel like what we have to do. And then it feels like you're wearing somebody else's clothes. And that's what it felt like for me. And two years in, I was like, I don't really want to be like fancy and put together. And I don't want to only do $20,000 budget floral weddings. And I don't want to listen to classical music when we design flowers. I want to like listen to Lizzo and Lady Gaga and wear jeans and sweatpants and like drink champagne with my clients. So I changed our entire brand. So, um, really checking in a lot to see if things feel like yours. How do I find ways to be innovative in a specific industry? This is a really great question. Um, so I think, again, this goes back to never really paying too close of attention to what others are doing as your marker for what you have to do next. Like really being able to feel that gut and be like, I'm just gonna, we're just gonna try this. This is us, I use the example. So we did wreath kits this year and I hadn't seen anyone else do a wreath kit. And I was like, I just have a feeling this could work. Like we'll send everybody everything they need to build a holiday wreath and we'll teach them how with a video. And I think that was pretty innovative in an industry that is very old school. Flowers, I know we're getting trendy. I know we're getting hot. We're getting cool. But there is a, um, a really diehard group of people who don't want floristry to change. 
and just being okay that we're going to do it different. So I think being innovative means accepting that it's not going to be for everybody. I think being innovative means understanding like, okay, we're going to go our own way here. So my tips for how to be innovative would just, I look to other industries. I, I follow very closely other creatives who don't do what I do, like at all. Y'all, I'm over flowers. I'm over, I'm not over flowers. I'm just, I'm over like, I don't want my whole social media time or everything I consume to be flowers. That's my job. I get enough of them. I want to see what other amazing, passionate creatives are doing in their industry and how weird it is and how different it is and how they're changing their businesses. So being innovative comes from not being too concerned with what people in your industry are going to think. Because it's not going to be for everybody. I caught a little bit of flack for wreath kits and then everybody started doing them. And that's being innovative. That's a, those are the two ingredients you need to be innovative. That's how you know you've hit a nerve. There are some people pissed, but then a lot of the people who are pissed start doing what you're doing. It feels good. Okay. How did I decide what niche to focus on when I started? Great question. So I say to everyone, when you start, do one thing. Do one thing. And do it really well for a couple of years, really well. We chose weddings because they were a higher dollar item that we knew I could also simultaneously do with my TV job. So you really have to think about how things are gonna work into your life. So I knew, okay, weddings are on weekends. There's a lot of them up North. Um, and you know, I can book someone for $1,800. I can book someone for $2,500. That means I only have to do a handful a year and still really make progress on this business. Another option would be, I can sell, I can make 50 pieces of pottery on a Saturday and sell them for $50 each. Okay, that is like a niche that you're gonna go into because you can still work your full-time job if this is the position you're in and also really start growing the business. I see so many people who are like, well, I don't have any growth, but they're selling a low price product, which is not a bad thing, but they're just selling one low price item and they want that to have them leave their full-time job. So my best friend owns a smoothie company. It's an incredible smoothie company. And she realized like maybe a year ago we had a meeting and she was like, I'm not going to be able to leave my full-time job just selling smoothies. So it's like, what can we do? What, can, what, what product can we also add into the mix that isn't going to change our output or our ability or our scale, but that's going to increase our revenue and our profitability. So really understanding what niche you want to get into and where you want to be for a couple of years. Okay, this question says, I feel like I'm stuck in the spot where you were when you realized you needed to rebrand. Thank you for sharing this part of your journey. It's so helpful to hear about the struggle and see how much success you have now being authentically you. Thank you, that's very kind. The advice I often get is to do the same thing other people in my field are doing, even though my personal style is so different. <laughs> my eyes are like watering, this is hard. Was there a lot of advice you had to ignore? Yes. Yes. Oh my gosh. Yes. You have to be okay understanding that a lot of people who think they're helping you are asshats. They don't know. It's like, it's, I mean, my mom, I love my mom. My mom is my idol. She is incredible. And her being like, I really think you need to get into funerals. Everyone gets flowers for funerals and florists do funerals. And I was like, yeah, and it's not profitable and it's not my vibe. Love you, mom. Peace. You got to be okay hearing the advice, nod, smile if it's your vibe, say thank you so much for your opinion. You know, we'll, we'll consider it. And then just being like, bye. Personal style is a big thing. Um, my friend, one of my dear friends is an artist. Um, she does murals, hand lettering. She's incredibly talented. 
she built a brand that was very on trend, very on trend. Beautiful hand lettering that was very trendy at the time. Um, a lot of gold accents, a lot of pink accents, a lot of white, a lot of white marble vibes on her Instagram. And then I met her finally in person and I was like, what? You're like a badass. You're wearing like a leather jacket. Like you're six feet tall. You have cool glasses. Like you're funky. You're weird. Why is this not your brand? So you have your personal style in the art you make, the product you design and the life you lead. That's your flair. That is your flair. That has to be a part of your brand. It has to be. We have friends right now who are starting a winery. They're in the very, very early ages. I mean, this is like 10 years out from now, but they just moved back from France and they're just like totally badass and they're amazing. And they're moving to Traverse City, which is awesome. Um, and I just see how well they're going to do because they, they've traveled and they've taken in so much of this wine industry and they've learned so much from Europe. And then they're going to come here and put their personal brand into it. And that is what makes you different. It is not going to succeed when you build a brand for somebody else. When you build the brand that's doing well. I see this happen all the time. So I'm like really heated up, passionate about that question. Yes, ignore advice. How did I learn the actual elements of floral design? Quick answer, self-taught. Google, the school of Google got my PhD on YouTube is what I like to say. There are so many free resources out there. They are, it is like the age we are in right now, I could, if I tried, if I tried really hard, I think I could be a pretty good barista, right? A lot of studying, a lot of good video out there. Anything you want, there are affordable classes on it, free resources out there, blogs, the Instagram TVs, YouTube. That's how I learned, self-taught. And also a lot of mistakes, like five gazillion mistakes. Okay, I think this is the last one. Cool. How do I avoid the grass is always greener mistake in career changes? Such a good question. What questions do I ask myself and how do I carefully plan the next move? This is an incredible question. So the grass is always going to seem greener when you aren't happy, um, when you aren't fulfilled, like we talked about in the very beginning. And I'm going to wrap up here. So this is actually the perfect segue. So I always thought that the grass would be greener if I was in a different TV market, if I was on a different show, um, a different schedule, if I was at a different station. Um, if I owned my own business, it would just be so much easier. Our life would be so much easier. And then um, I never think the grass is greener now. Never. I never think like, man, it would be so much better if we blank. And I think that's because we've built something, Matt and I together, that really, really fulfills me. It really does. And of course, of course, there are going to be horrible days, horrible days, any job in the world. They call it a job. It's not called a vacation. Um, this is why I loathe the quote and I loathe the movement of, if you find a job you truly love, you'll never work a day in your life. I'm like, no, I love my job. I love this brand. I love this business, but I work every day. It is work. It's hard work. Um, but I still feel fulfilled by it. And that really, I think the big awakened moment is when I look out and I see people who have, my friends have incredible jobs, incredible. They are so, so talented, big time jobs, medical sales, and they make crazy money and they have very glamorous lifestyles. And I'm like, that doesn't, I'm just really great here. And it's, it's not like a, that seems like it's horrible or that seems like it's better. It's, it's just like, I feel so fulfilled in what I do. So I think that's how to avoid the grass is greener is to build something that really fulfills you, even though it will be scary. It will piss some people off in your life. Their opinion doesn't matter. People who love you will come back around and you're going to make a million mistakes and it could blow up in your face. There could be five iterations of it until you find the one that sticks. So I'm really, really, really grateful um, for that question. I think it was the perfect one. And I'm, I'm just so grateful that you guys were here today. And I hope you learned something. And I hope you feel 
inspired and fulfilled and ready to like go, go take on the world and um, reach out to me if you need anything else on Instagram at Sweetwater Floral. You can email me directly, Kaylin at sweetwaternorth.com and I will hand it back over to Camille. Thank you so much, Kaylin. Also, amazing questions from everyone. Thank you so much for your engagement. It was incredible. Um, friendly reminder that this webinar has been recorded and it will be posted to the Traverse Connect YouTube page within 24 hours. So thank you again, everyone, for joining. Thank you, Kaylin. Over and out. <laughs>